Hey everybody, today I want to talk about bearings. As you may know, I regularly make videos to explain basic principles to do with motorcycles and motorcycle mechanics and things like that. And in this one, I want to talk about bearings. Now, bearings as a subject is huge. So I am only really talking about the types that you find in motorcycles and I'm going to keep this at basic terms for beginners. I'm going to talk about the different types and why you use different types. Uh, I'm also going to show you some of the applications uh, it sort of, you know, in motorcycles, explain a few bits. Uh, it should be quite interesting, I hope. Let's start at the beginning with bushes because bushes are bearings, but not all bearings are bushes. Basically, if you imagine you drilled a hole through a piece of metal, you put a rod through it, which was ever so slightly smaller, you could turn that in there quite easily. If you put some load on it, it will probably start to get more friction. It's going to get hotter and it's going to wear the surfaces away. And sooner or later, it's going to destroy the rod and it's going to fall apart. Yeah. A bushing would be you drill that hole in the piece of metal, uh, but you drill it bigger and you put in something in between and then the, the, the uh, rod goes through the middle and then you've got a wearing surface that can be replaced. Now, bushes are bearings because they are a bearing surface. And the way that bushes work basically is they have a, a very hard coating inside, which is also very smooth and slippery. It can also sometimes take oil very well. Uh, and it means it has a film of oil on it. And these just guide the tubes up and down. There's no spinning action or any fast, fast motion. Well, I suppose if forks are going down, up and down quite fast, but, you know what I mean? It's, it's not a spinning engine and they just guide things. So that's what bushes generally do. You do also get rubber bushes and what they tend to do is just keep things in line but give them a little bit of, mo a little bit of movement. A good example is on some bikes they use these like rubber washers that attach the handlebar, um, handlebars and mounts to the yokes and it gives you a vibration resistance. And the way that works is you just clamp the piece of rubber in between, it's held strong enough that it holds it and only has a little tube in there or something, but the movement is dampened by the rubber. So that is like a, a rubber bushing. They also are used in very, very high load situations, like, I don't know, like a, a swing bridge or something, it will pivot on something. It probably won't be a bearing, it'll be more like a bushing or an oil-filled bushing of some sort that actually has an entire you know, encapsulated film of oil in there. So it sits on the oil, not the metal when it turns, something like that. But you know, that's their general use. Most common type of bearing is the classic ball bearing that we all know so well. Obviously you get these in your skateboard wheels, your push bikes, everything. They're normally quite a lot spinner, fidget spinners as well. Uh, the way that these work is that they have balls in them held in a race. This is called the inner race, this is called the outer race. These are the balls and the thing that holds them together is the cage. This one happens to have a depth limiting clip on the side of it, which I'll show you why that's there in a minute. So the purpose of a bearing is simple and it's this. This weighs the same amount no matter how we put it. Yep. But if I try pushing it like this, it's not really going anywhere. If I do this, it rolls because you've just got this very thin contact point here and it, if the load fall goes over it, it always wants to fall over itself. That's how something rolls. This is doing the same thing. It's causing a very small contact area between the inner ball and the outer ball. I have got one of these taken apart, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. But by limiting the contact patch between those two surfaces, you create a very low friction um, area and also you can go very high speed with these because you have that low sorry small contact point you don't get a lot of friction and heat build up so these can spin very fast and don't really heat up necessarily or at least too much uh, they do come into different types of varieties you know you have these which are your standard ball bearings um, deep groove ball bearings they have a cage in them you also get ones like this which is the exact same thing but the difference is it's sealed and on that note, I think it's a good time to show you this one. Because I spent some time earlier on making this a demonstration one. So as I mentioned earlier, you have the standard bearings that are open and you have the sealed ones. The way these are sealed, if we pull this apart here, is you can see there is actually a groove for the seal on each side. So it actually fits right in there tightly. And if we then take the seal, well, if we pull the other side off, we can then lift the seal off. And as you can see, the seal is just a thin piece of metal with like a, I guess it's a nitride rubber or something like that on there. 
and then inside you have the balls of the ball bearings that sit within a groove on the inner race. And then the groove in the outer race sits like that. Now if you look at this, you can see how this is designed to take load from the top, so a radial force going downwards through it. So it's set up to do that because the balls run in a track and then it sits between all of the balls. However, these bearings do not like thrust loads or axial side loading. So you put use these, you know, as, as uh, wheel bearings in a motorcycle and um, and they're used in the engines as well. Obviously wheel bearings, you have one either side, the axle goes through the middle, so the weight of the bike goes directly up through these bearings and they do great at that job. Not so relevant to motorcycles, but relevant enough to mention is the fact you also have a thing called a roller bearing, where instead of having a ball, there's another ball bearing rolling off over there. So having a ball, you have a roller. And this one is like a drum shape. Uh, and if you can imagine that you have those going all the way around there, those bearings, because they have a much larger surface area to work between, uh, they are much better at taking much, much higher loads. Because obviously with this, you're just going between the pinpoint top of each of these balls to the between the races. And you're working on the hardness of the metal not giving uh, under that force. Well. If you put a huge amount of weight on it, they're going to dig into them or it's going to shatter because this sort of metal is very, very hard. In fact, one easy trick to get an inner race off of a shaft uh, is to put a small cut in it and hit it with a hammer or even just smack it with a hammer and it will shatter off. Uh, don't necessarily advise in doing that, but in some applications it's absolutely fine. If you use these rollers instead of balls, you get a much larger surface area and that means you can have more weight on that bearing. However, they don't like going as fast because they have a larger contact patch, they then build up friction and heat more. There are various different types of bearings that use different shaped elements, as they're called. Uh, the, the balls, the drums are all called elements. So as I say, roller bearings are a thing, not necessarily as applicable to motorcycles. I'm sure there are some out there that take them and use them, but generally in a motorcycle, you're gonna find three types of bearing, unless I'm getting sidetracked and confused. Okay, so a classic application for one of these types of bearings, keeping in mind that it wants to take a force radially straight through it, not actually through the side, is in engine casings for, you know, for your crankshaft and for gearboxes and things like that, where you'll have a pair of bearings, one here, one on the other side, the shaft will push into it and it will sit and it will run here. Now these sorts of bearings have to be held in seats because the outer stays still and the inner turns. And that is a friction fit. Basically, that means that this hole and this bearing are very close in size because I can't just fit, push this in, you know, by hand. It has to be either, well, it shouldn't be beaten in, it should be pressed in. So let's quickly press this one in and I'll also show you how you remove them. I think it's fairly self-evident that this is not the way you would do this for a working machine. You would, you would have this in a proper press or something. My point is simply that bearings should be pushed in and not hit in. And you have to make sure that you get them even. Otherwise, if they kink over sideways, what ends up happening is they get stuck and they can even damage the seat. So you normally use tools and things that help guide them in. So it's now in there and the shaft would go in here and you'd have a corresponding one on the other side. And that's how that sort of bearing would work. And obviously inside an engine, this open type is great because then oil gets inside there, which helps minimize the uh, friction because bearings do need to be lubricated. In fact, when a bearing's properly lubricated, it more runs on the oil than it actually runs on the metal of the bearing. That's why if you run out of oil, your bearings are going to go bang quite quickly. The, the, the process that happens there is it obviously without the oil, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, and normally the balls will become damaged and they're gonna wedge, and then the shaft might spin within, within here, or it can even spin the outer if it completely locks up. That can be known as spinning the bearing, and a problem you have there is if it happens in an engine casing and the outer turns, you then wear away the engine casing uh, and you can't get the same size bearing in. Big problem. Now, as I say, this is a blind hole, but that limiter means there is a little bit of a gap underneath. There are methods to get this out in various different ways. You can cover this up and pump grease in the middle, or you can use a slide hammer to just pop it out. This is a slide hammer that you can use to remove bearings. It's called a slide hammer because it's a hammer. This is the hammer part and it slides, and it allows you to hit things out rather than hitting them in. The tool on the end 
is basically a spike. You can see, and that's going to push up inside this, which has been cut into four, which spreads out inside the bearing. Tighten those together. So now you take the hammer of the slide hammer, making sure everything's tightly in there, uh, and you give it a good whack. Normally it will take more than that. This bearing doesn't really live in that hole, but it's close. So as I say, this is the most common type of bearing you'll find in a bike. It's wheel bearings, um, bearings in the engine, things like that. They're particularly good at high speed applications. And if it's got good lubrication, they last a very long time. As I say, ones inside engines will be naturally open like this. Ones open to the elements like this one, or even a skateboard wheel tend to be sealed to keep the dirt and the grit out. And there is an amount of oil in there, which, or should we say grease, which is non-serviceable. These sorts of bearings are what are known as non-serviceables because you can't take them apart without damaging them and get, yeah. So these are serviceable in the sense that you can change the oil or the grease in them. I've stuck a shaft in this one. Should we spin it up really quick for a laugh? This is a definite warning, don't try this at home. But this might have an interesting effect. Oh god, oh god, oh god. Sparks. Okay, it did have the effect I was hoping for. Okay, that was brilliant. Let me just do this again. Look at the magic. It's processing, but look. Oh, I'm gone. Right, now I'm gonna try and hold it in the same orientation I did just now. Physics is amazing. The codes on them tell you the inner and outer diameter working on the codes that bearings work on because you don't get, um, you get 10 mil bearings and you get 12 mil, mil bearings, you don't get 11 mil bearings. And on the code, the first code refers to the outer diameter. So this one says uh, 6904RS. So the 6.9 is going to let us know what the outer diameter is. The 0.4 u times by 5, which will give you 20, which would make me believe that the internal diameter of this bearing is 20 millimetres, which it is. But just know that when you're re replacing bearings, if you need to replace it, that code will tell people everything they need to know about what it is. They're quite easy to find replacements for bearings and without having to go for, you know, the, the brand specific one that will cost you three, four times as much. Though cheap bearings can be a problem, so you know. So that, as I say, covers this standard type of bearing. We've kind of covered the role of bearing types like this, which is in more heavy applications. Now, before we move on to the tapered bearings, you can see this is slightly different. The balls are doing the same job between the outer and the inner race, but instead of having a cage which holds them um, for pinching in the middle, this shaft, which happens to be out of an R1, was in a Yamaha R1 gearbox um, because of recalls, this one has got like, it, it's solid that way and it's got holes in it so the bearing can still run, but instead of being held as I say, like, like clamped either side in the cheaper versions, this one is more retained in the center. I'm sure that's to make them better and stronger and longer lasting. This gearbox shaft is taking the forces with another bearing on the other end through this. There is no side to side like that. But if you look at this like the steering stem on a motorcycle, if you think this is held in the frame and this is the steering, you're gonna have forces trying to not only go side to side as you're turning it, but also up and down. And as I say, these are not good at taking those sorts of forces, only these sorts. And that is why we have these. And this is what's gone wrong with my DR. These, in fact, are the old ones out of the DR. And I'm gonna show you, because someone asked about this, and I thought, you know, that's why I'm making this video about bearings, because there is a lot to them, uh, but at the same time, not a huge amount that you need to know. 
but also just knowing what their jobs are and, and how little can put them out of commission. Because I've cleaned these completely knackered bearings up. And when I say completely knackered, the steering was on like detents. It was like dunk, 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 dunk. That's horrendous. Right, okay. But look, you know, they seem absolutely fine, but they're definitely not. Anyway, as I say, this looks like a normal bearing, and this is from the steering, but this is a tapered roller bearing. Now, the, the way this is engineered, or designed, should we say, is that this, the, the inner race, is straight here for the shaft, obviously, but it is a cone. The individual rollers, which are similar to this sort of style of roller, but the difference is they're conical. They are cone shaped. So this is more like if you took a, I don't know, a metal spike, a giant needle that goes to a point and you chopped a section out some way along it, this end is thicker than this end. But what the interesting thing is, is that if the trajectory of each one of these cones was continued into a point, is in it like a spike, they would all meet at the exact same point as a cone. On the opposite race, which sits in the frame, you have a thick side and a thin side, and they lock together like that, and they get clamped. These are generally, or always, used in pairs, opposing each other. Uh, so, here's the other one. So they'd be like this, and you'd clamp them together. So there's a bar going through, and the force is being put against each of them to pull them into themselves. Because obviously, they work, in both this direction, because you've got the roller side actually taking that radial force, but you have thrust, because this is this at the side loading, thrust bearings, where you can put pressure on the top of it as well. And if you can imagine, because it's cone shaped, as long as it's been pushed in this way, it's gonna just hold together better. I'm trying to think of another place on a bike that you would use a, roller, a tapered roller bearing opposed to one of these. And I can't think of anything other than the, uh, the steering, as I say. I might be wrong on that, but there isn't many other applications where we use tapered bearings. Oh, I was gonna say about tapered bearings. Someone did ask me like to clean up the, the completely knackered bearings and see what they're like. Uh, and all I can report on is that even looking at these up like a little microscope, the surfaces are quite scratched, but they still feel smooth that they spin freely, very rattly. Uh, though this is the bottom one which was the worst one maybe this will rattle more than this one I don't know they both sound pretty bad but obviously when they've got grease in them that stops them rattling uh, but there is too much free play in these and you also get in the outer races indentations and grooves and marks from those rollers if the bike sits still, as I've discovered, the thing that seems to kill uh, bearings for steering is when you use the bike a lot, they're getting a little bit old and then you don't use it for a while or the load shifts on them and then they're not in the perfect place they've always been and then they just don't align properly anymore and they start doing this, this gnarly, graunchy, notching, detent feel like steering where it's like or just very stiff. So the last one I want to talk about is needle bearings. Needle bearings are very much like the roller bearings uh, with drums in them, like this. However, the diameter is going to be a lot less than the length. Uh, so if it looks like a needle like that, opposed to, you know, something that's pretty evenly, you know, length to width, that's a roller, that's a needle. Now you might notice that the cage for these is actually a plastic retainer. So you might imagine through deduction that this is probably not gonna be spinning very fast and indeed they don't. These are used in applications where you don't have a lot of space between two surfaces uh, or places where you don't need to spin it, it just needs to pivot. And obviously without the spinning, it doesn't have the heat. So the, the, the housing doesn't need to be metal, although very often, very commonly, they are. These are, you know, metal, different sized, ones. These sort of open types would go between shafts, there would be a place for them to go. And you get other ones like this, which this would be pressed in like a normal bearing into a hole, and then a shaft would go through here and it would allow it to turn smoothly. Classic place you'll find these is on things like steering columns on cars, 
because unlike on a motorcycle, obviously the steering wheel is only taking side to side loads, it's not taking front to back loads. So you don't need to worry about that, you just need it to turn smoothly. So that's why you find these sorts of things. Now, because I didn't change the bearings in my swing arm pivot because they seemed okay, I still have these left over for when I learned that they weren't and I have to do them, probably just after I get the forks done. Here's some seals. And the seals, you can see this one's got a seal on it. This is actually part of it because it's sort of pressed together, but when you take them off, that's what it looks like. So these are the needle bearings, very much like this. And then what you have is a shaft like this, which goes through the middle of a couple of those needle bearings. So if you imagine one side of the swing arm pivots where there's the axle going through, you'll have a couple of needle bearings and this sitting in the middle that is the perfect size to fit inside those. And then your axle bolt, wherever that's gonna turn, is gonna go inside here and again be a close fit. But what this means is that once it's all filled with grease and everything's clamped in, the this will move independently to the, you know, to the outside because of the bearing, but you also don't have any friction on the inner axle as such, apart from the fact that it'll probably be pinned from either end, which means that you end up pivoting this on this. And obviously in the application of a swing arm, it's going up and down. There's, you know, there's quite a bit of force there, uh, and, that's, and it's okay to take quite a lot of force to these because they have a large amount of surface area, but not too much, obviously, because you only have so much material holding up against it, opposed to something big and thick like this. And this is where the different sizes and applications come in and it gets very complicated. Well, no, it's not very complicated, but it's beyond what we need to talk about for motorcycles. Sorry, there is one more type, it, not these washers, but the thing in between. Uh, if you can, as you can see, this is a needle bearing but it's designed to take the force that way, opposed to that way. See? You'd use something like this for, if you had a very large weight and you wanted it to rotate in place and the forces are only going straight down, you'd use something like this. And there obviously there is more bits to it, but that is, you know, another way of using needle bearings. Oh, are these actually needles? I think they are long enough that their, their diameter to length still makes them needles. Um, but yeah, that's another type of needle bearing. So if you, if, you know, if you think about this from common sense from what I've said so far, I think you can work out visually like, okay, that makes sense. Because a bearing basically just takes a force through it and reduces the friction of that turning. This wants to go that way. This one, because of the balls, wants to go that way. They can take a little bit of side loading, but not a huge amount. Uh, I think if you have deeper grooves in them, you probably can take more loadings and there are different specifications for each type of bearing that can take different loads. Like you could buy this bearing for maybe, I don't know, two quid and, well, it's not really two quid, but you know what I mean. Uh, and it will take X amount of thrust loading sideways. Uh, but if you buy a more expensive one, it might be able to take more thrust loading sideways. But if you're going to be dealing with an application where you need both the radial and thrust loading, well then you go for a tapered bearing anyway, or one of the various different other types. There are types that have double sided that can allow it to kind of weeble wobble a little bit, but it always keeps the same amount of contact area. So in an application where something's spinning but it can wiggle around a little bit, it helps take out some of that vibration because obviously if you have uh, two of these types of bearings and you have a shaft through it which is bent, it's going to cause a problem because they aren't going to be turning at the exact same time as they exactly want to if that part in between becomes bent. This video is probably a lot longer than I was intending, but to cover the basics of what you see on a motorcycle, it takes as long as it takes. And I'm trying to help people learn these things rather than just entertain them, which is why I don't get so many likes sometimes. So if you did enjoy this video and you found it interesting or useful, please do hit that like button. Subscribe if you are new here. And if you want to help support this channel and me supplying information like this, this is kind of one of the ways that I try and do my videos with Patreon is that there is what is known as a value for value thing where Hopefully some of the information that I give you through the videos will save you that money back in jobs in the future And it's a win-win situation for everyone That's if you can do it and if you wish to or if you just want to help support this channel for the entertainment value Then please do that too uh, But as I say it is only down to the small number of patrons that make this channel actually possible So yeah, thank you to them. Thank you to you for watching and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye-bye